Hi, my name is Lindy Jung and welcome back to my channel. So we're going to get started in a little bit. I really wanted to get this video out even though it's a very inconvenient time for me because I'm currently backpacking through Southeast Asia and I'm in Phnom Penh in Cambodia right now and I literally have a bus to catch in like an hour. But before I get into the horror writing tips, I'm going to say something. And I know that this is going to put some people off the video, whatever, I'm not going to not speak on this because I'm not a monster and I basically have no other social media platforms at this point where my voice could maybe even make the slightest bit of difference. So. If you were not already aware, there is an active attempt at genocide and ethnic cleansing going on in Gaza against Palestinian people. I stand with Palestine. I'm not going to get too much into the details. I feel like most people have already sort of decided what they believe. Um, the thing that I can do and the thing that, although it seems, again, very much like I'm not doing anything at all is link some donation links below to the PCRF, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Over half of the population of Gaza are children. I've linked that below. I've also linked this initiative that I saw through Instagram. That's basically a bunch of people in traditional publishing, like authors and I think some other professionals who have gotten together and if you donate to the PCRF and then provide proof of donation, you could win a critique or some free books. There's a lot of good stuff in there, so I'm just going to link that below because that seems relevant to the audience. And if you want something in exchange for your money in this like economic period, I don't blame you. So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. It did take me a while because I haven't been able to sit down and film a fresh video since before the conflict really started. I mean, it started years ago, but before the conflict really escalated, I deactivated Twitter so I don't really have like public social media platforms anymore. And this is my biggest platform and I wanted to say something. So now that that's said, let's go ahead and start with the video. In 2020, I made a horror writing advice video. As always, you know, prescriptivist writing advice is for the birds. You can take these or leave these as you'd like, and you can take those or leave them as you'd like. They were pretty generic. They were like an overview of what I thought constituted strong horror writing. And I did have a pretty good idea of that at the time, but at this point I've actually like written a lot more horror and horror adjacent things. So I feel a lot more comfortable getting very specific about what I think helps elevate horror writing and make it pop. So I'm going to make this relatively quick. Number one is to lean into primary sensory details. A really, really good example of a short story that you can read for free online is When You Lee's Laura Lau Will Drain You Dry on Nightmare Magazine. I'll link that below. To me, the primal senses tend to be touch, smell, and taste, which also tend to be a lot less utilized in comparison to like hearing and sight. But one thing that I wanna mention here is that I feel like a lot of newer writers have a tendency to just have sensory things happen to the character. But two things in the Laura Lau story that I think really worked in terms of just like depicting that sensory stimulation is one, combining sensory details. So touch or sensation and taste and smell will all be combined. And also tying sensory detail into character action instead of having sensory details be something that are just flung onto the character or just happen as a result of some environmental element. That is totally fine, but I think it's so much more visceral when it's a result of the character actually doing something. Like not to give you any spoilers for the story that I've mentioned, but the main character will bite into something and you get that combination of the sensation, the touch and the taste it's so gross and it's so good. And having it be a result of a direct action that the character takes, something that they do, something that they choose to do, just elevates it and makes it so much more visceral and so much more grounded and real and just good, just vivid. Another thing you can do is use unexpected sensory details to create that sense of unease and that disconnect. A lot of like that uh, uncomfortable sensation comes from this juxtaposition between what you expect and what you know and the unexpected and the unknown. And the unknown is something I talked about a lot in my first video. So for example, an unexpected sensory detail might come about when the main character encounters a beautiful woman at a bar and they're talking and she's gorgeous and she's funny. And then maybe that main character sort of like leans in and catches a whiff of her perfume and it smells like old blood. That's unexpected. You don't really want to smell that ever, <laughs> but especially in the context of having that be a beautiful woman's chosen perfume, like that's instantly going to make you wonder what is going on beneath the surface. Number two is tie the circumstances or the plot or the situation of your story into the POV character as much as possible. Give them a personal stake, basically. We're kind of past that era of horror where the main character is just a victim, like this is just happening to them for no reason, but it's still definitely a thing. So instead of having a protagonist have no idea why this is happening to them or who this serial killer or ghost or monster or whatever that's after them is, create personal stakes for a more interesting and layered story. They might not know right off the bat why this is happening to them, but if it's revealed over time that they kind of have this coming, it just creates 
creates a more interesting story. I don't know how else to describe it. This is sort of a vague and blanket statement tip. Another example I can think of is that if you're using a familiar trope or situation, such as, for example, the haunted house, I really recommend digging into this. Tropes are a tool. They're a writer's tool. They're meant to be used. There's nothing inherently wrong with them. I do personally think that just slapping down tropes without really examining them or deconstructing them or doing anything particularly interesting with them and just using them for the trope's sake, I think that will hurt the story more than help it. So for example, with the haunted house story, instead of just having a random haunted house full of ghosts that the protagonist unwittingly buys or steps into, make it so that it's a haunted house full of the ghosts of the main character's victims or something like that, something personal to really anchor it. Number three is to foster atmosphere and ambiance through environmental cues. I'm a slut for a good environment, for a good setting, especially one that's like an isolated, spooky nature setting. I've spent a lot of time actually in really remote areas just because of my last job. And let me tell you right off the bat, it is way more than like mist and shadows that makes these isolated places scary. It's your own paranoia, first of all. It's not knowing what's going on in the dark. It's hearing weird noises or noticing discrepancies. Like for example, noticing branches moving when there's no wind, seeing like little flickers of light for no reason, or seeing like the reflection of light on the ground when you shine your flashlight. Fun fact, those are usually spider eyes. You have one million spiders looking at you at any given moment. So in your story, even when nothing is happening, because pretty much every story is going to have that preliminary point where you're just sort of establishing the situation, the characters, and the setting, you can still create that sense of like wickedness or eeriness, that ambiance, just with environmental cues. And this is going to be something that you strengthen through prose. Like this is not a storytelling skill set, it's a prose writing skill set. And I do think that good prose really helps horror shine. I think this is one of the genres where good prose, pretty prose, eloquent prose, descriptive prose, all that is going to help the story shine. I really like horror with good writing. I don't know. Number four is a little tip. It's just an idea. If you're stuck, turn your main character into the monster or have your main character turn out to be the monster all along. I really like this. I played with this a little bit in my short story, Esther Park or The Fall of Esther Park. I always just call it Esther, which is also linked below that came out through Apparition Lit. That's sort of a horror story, but it's also a love story. I just feel like it's so rich for metaphor to have your character transform in some way or be fundamentally transformed by the events of the story. This can be metaphorical, of course, or it can be literal. I kind of like it when it's literal. Number five is to keep your story short and sweet. I might change my mind on this later in life, but currently I'm sort of of the opinion that horror primarily thrives in short form fiction. Most of the horror novels I've read haven't really captured me because they just sort of tend to overstay their welcome. Stuff tends to be over explained. I just get sort of tired as I read them. I don't know, maybe it's like the TikTok attention span or something. But really in short fiction, horror thrives because there's less requirement for explanation and you can focus more on the vibes and the actual scariness of it. I feel like all of my favorite horror stories are short fiction or novellas, so do with that what you will. Number six is to make your characters experience small physical discomfort, especially early on in the narrative. I've been really struggling to articulate what I mean by this into words. So I'm just gonna give you an example. If your character is on a tropical island, maybe it's their honeymoon, or their dream vacation destination and you start the story off by focusing on the beauty of that location but also focusing on the fact that one they're drenched in sweat two it's so hot they're constantly suffering heat exhaustion three they have like mosquito bites literally all over their body nothing helps they're itchy all the time four you know they have sand in unmentionable places and they can't seem to get it out start off with those like relatable details one especially if you have a setting that's supposed to be like nice it creates that sense of unease. Two, it also roots you, or the reader specifically, in the character's body. Again, we're circling back to that thing I said in the first video about relatable physical sensations, like smaller pains being more visceral because they're more relatable. For example, a nail getting ripped out versus getting like shot three times in the stomach. Establishing physical discomfort in this way is a great way to root your reader in that character's body, to give them that instant like sense of attachment, and to again, establish that sense of unease and like, ooh, this is kind of gross. This won't work for every story. I think this will probably work really well for stories that utilize a lot of that sensory description anyway. There's so many different forms of horror story can take that it's hard to specifically pinpoint what I mean by this, but I hope that sort of described that for you. Number seven is to utilize irony. By this, I mostly mean like, an ironic voice. I love horror with a little bit of cheek in the narration. I love a sassy horror narrator. I think it just works really well. It just always does it for me. An example of this 
was actually a novel. This was a novel that came out pretty recently. It's The Dead Take the A-Train by Cassandra Cott and Richard Cady. I actually didn't love the actual plot of this, but one, it had really good sensory description and two, the main character's voice, even though it was third person. There's actually multiple points of view, but the voices just came through for me. What I mean by like a snarky character voice is usually someone who's cracking jokes throughout the scary stuff, who's lampshading what's happening, who has some level of genre awareness or just like an idea of how ridiculous this is that a ghost is chasing them or whatever but the thing with this the beauty about this type of character being your narrator is that you can usually but not always but possibly always have that oh shit moment where they realize they're actually in deep trouble and that gives you as the reader who sort of had let your guard down because it doesn't feel as scary when the main character is like ah this is so ridiculous it makes that moment hit a lot harder that sudden tone shift is very jarring and i feel like it's always like such a crux and that's when you realize you've hit that climax is that oh shit this main character who did not really care about what's happening now realizes this is serious business but also just voice you writing in general is fun for me number eight is tighten your pov horror just works really well when it's super intimate this means really close third person or first person narration but it doesn't have to. These are generally going to be your best picks for horror though, especially if you're really focused on this one character undergoing this experience. You want to really feel everything they're feeling. Utilizing really close POV can generate that sense of isolation, that like me versus the world feeling. If you think about like most horror movies, even the ones with ensemble casts, the main character is really going to be the one undergoing the brunt of the shitty I'm thinking about Scream here specifically. This is a really common horror trope because it is scarier to deal with the unknown when you're on your own or you're the only competent one versus when you have people to rely on and work together with. You can play with this, of course. You can have someone start out thinking that, oh, I'm not alone. I have people around me who can help me and they're super competent and I'm not that competent, but I can just let them do it and figure things out and then have the competent people die off one by one and have the protagonist like left to their own devices or they can just literally be completely alone. like just locked in a maze trying to get out on their own while they're being chased by all sorts of monsters. It really does give you a sense of comfort if multiple characters are trying to deal with a horror situation. That's why Scooby-Doo is never scary. One, it's a children's cartoon and you know that people are gonna be unmasked, but also all of them are sort of pulling their own weight, even Scooby and Shaggy. So you never feel like they're facing these horrors on their own. Also, a little note here is that a lot of people seem to interpret close POV as a ton of internal monologue. This usually, I feel like doesn't work for me with horror. You want a good balance of internal monologue and like that physicality almost. For me, close POV means just a mix of you're in their head, but also you're in their body. So you're feeling what they're feeling and you're thinking what they're thinking, but you're also sensing what they're sensing experiencing what they're experiencing. So instead of just writing a bunch of internal monologue, which can lead to like over-rationalization, which can take the reader out of the story, once again, just focus on the physical, the sensory, and those split second decisions that sort of like primal side of the character instead of the rational side for horror. That is the video. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys next time. Hopefully I can get this out before Halloween. I'm gonna try to edit it on the bus really quickly. As always, let me know what you guys think and if you have your own tips for writing horror or if you have any horror story recommendations, please let me know because it is spooky season and although I'm in the tropics and not experiencing an autumn right now, I still want to kind of get into the mood. I'll talk to you guys later and have a great day. Bye.